Dr. Lewis Sperry Chafer addressing students of Dallas Theological Seminary in Lectures on the Spiritual Life. Lecture 6. Power to Do Good. Subtopic 2 continued. The Gifts of the Spirit. Subtopic 3. The Offering of Praise and Thanksgiving. Subtopic 4. The Teaching of the Spirit. Our God and Father, we're counting on thy blessing this morning. We have committed it to thee that we should have evidence of thy presence and power. Thy truth should lay hold of our hearts in a very sanctifying, purifying way and be permanent effect upon us for Christ's sake. Amen. Now, once more, back to the doctrine of gifts. This time we are, it begins on page 215. Now, I suppose that the, I suppose that the whole program of gifts is very dim in your mind and very difficult for you to place it, largely because nothing is made of it at all. It's a possibly a, an omitted thing in our churches today. When have you ever heard a sermon or teaching or anything calculated to develop this, this great subject? And yet here it is one of the central manifestations of the Spirit in the exercise of a gift. Now, I've tried to say that a gift is not your natural ability, such as music or speech or something of that kind. You may be uh, gifted in some particular way in art or some line of education, you may have gifts, natural gifts. Now, the Spirit may use those, I don't know, but that's not the idea of the gift. The gift is some special endowment, and I put it just as strong as I know how to make it. That is, that the Spirit is doing something through you and using you to do it. It's not you doing something by the Spirit's help at all. You're not the one that's doing it. It's the Spirit that's doing it. And that through you, using you to do it. I don't know how to make it any stronger than that. Or to clarify it any more than that. Now there's a phase of this subject that is special that that does concern us, that we find in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. I'd like you to turn to it, then, because I don't want you to miss anything connected with this. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. I begin at 10. He that ascended is the same also in Descended is the same also that ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all the things. And in verse 8, he gave gifts unto men. He is the one who bestows the gift. He gives the gift to every man. And as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, such a gift is given to everyone to be profitable with all. And it's my business to find out so far as I can what what he intends of me according to the gift that he has bestowed upon me. Now then, verse 11, we have the ministry gifts, general, reaching out to the whole church. And he gave some uh, different ways of reading this. Some say he gave some localities apostles and some prophets 
but I think the other reading is better. He gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets and some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers. These are the peculiar ministry gifts of the age in which we're living, the age of the church. They're enumerated here, and it's reasonable to suppose that the list is more or less complete and exhaustive. <clears throat> the uh, day of the apostles is over, regardless of the teaching of the Anglican and Episcopal churches that they have apostolic succession. There is no scripture for an apostolic succession at all. Apostolic succession depends upon apostolic success. If you're going to have it depend on anything and not on putting empty hands on empty heads. <laughs> Let the apostles step out of the picture now as the age progresses. And he gave some to be prophets. Now what is a prophet? I go over to First Corinthians a minute. Chapter fourteen. Verse three. No, I'm wrong. I trust my memory and it doesn't always help me. A prophet speaketh to edification, comfort, declares exactly what the prophet's ministry is, but I don't, I don't turn to the passage at once. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort in what we now recognize to be just preaching, preaching the word. Remember that all through the scriptures the prophet has two the prophet has two ministries. One is foretelling and the other is forthtelling. Forthtelling and foretelling. Forthtelling is preaching. And just as sure as you stand up to declare the truth, you become a prophet. I'll go back to Ephesians again. And you come to the evangelist. And I have to raise a voice of correction here. We're not talking about the modern exhorter and, and uh, promoter that travels around under the name of evangelist. That's not here. An evangelist in this sense is a pioneer, a pioneer missionary one who goes where the gospel has never been preached before. I made that distinction and one of the evangelists in this country so-called has attacked me very vigorously for it. 
He's just on my track all the time over that. And yet he can't prove that I'm wrong. Where is there any proof or demonstration that I'm wrong and I say that the evangelist of the New Testament is the pioneer missionary out on the front line trenches, out doing the preliminary introductory work. That's the evangelist. Now it's a gift. It's an appointment from God, an endowment from God. I watch men come into school and watch them as they go through four years of work and then how they shape up and what their ambitions are by the time they get through. We waited to see evangelists. In the, even in the modern sense, but the men who have apparently the most natural disposition that way will almost universally come out saying, I want to teach. I want to teach. It's the result of our training here that men want to teach all the time, and we're putting teachers into the faculties all over our country today because they are the men that are qualified. I was thinking about it this morning, connection with the 25th anniversary, which we're celebrating when this school was first planned or organized. It was just about impossible to find a faculty in our country or anywhere. I combed the country from coast to coast and I knew just thousands of men, but they were not prepared to be on a faculty. They didn't have technical knowledge, for instance, in Hebrew and Greek to serve on a faculty. And we simply had to make our own faculty here, and we've done that. So that every man that's in the faculty today, excepting Dr. Brown, every man is a graduate of the seminary, has his degree here, and had his training so far as theology is concerned under me, every one of them. And we have a unified faculty. If you were to ask a question, doctrinal question, of one teacher and go to the next, you'd get the same answer probably, and not get a variety of answers. Now when in some faculties, you have a little of everything mixed up. You can imagine where a medical student would feel by noon if at 8 o'clock in the morning he recited to an allopath and at 9 o'clock in the morning he heard a homopath and 10 o'clock in the morning he had an osteopath and 11 o'clock he had another kind of a path to the grave. <laughs> With all of these paths to the graves, what would he say when he got through about noon? He'd say, I don't know what I believe. And that's what they usually say. Come out of the seminar and say, I don't know what I believe. I don't know what to say. I just don't know what to believe. Well, we want teachers. It's the age of the teacher and the period in the history of the church when the teacher is paramount. Now we have pastors and teachers, and they're joined together as though they were the same person bearing two distinct lines of gift. That is what Schofield told me. He says, your gift is that of a pastor and a teacher. But he said, you probably will never exercise the gift as a pastor just as I have very little, he said, you'll be a, a teacher and your teaching will take you from one place to another, which it has done thoroughly. Now, what's the objective here? Verse 13. Till we all believers come. Now, 12. For the perfecting, for the perfecting of the saints, 
unto their work of the ministry, the perfecting of the saints unto their work of the ministry, not the perfecting of the pastor and teacher unto his work of the ministry, but the saints have a ministry. The saints have a ministry, and they must be led in that and trained in it. I've made quite a good deal of this in, in the introduction to my volume one in theology. Sorry to say the average theological graduate doesn't know a thing about how to prepare people for the ministry. We have a graduate in Philadelphia who's pastor of a very large and prominent church there. One Sunday he said, I want to see on Thursday night all the men of the church who would like to learn how to win a soul to Christ. And on Thursday night, 70 of his men came. And they were so enthused about it. Or they said, this is the first time in the history of our church that anything's ever been done to help us at all in the things that we really want to do. Never anything done to help us at all. And they called themselves the 70 because they started off with that. They called themselves the 70. And we're known through the church as that. Now, the pastor gave them thorough instruction, and then you'd have this experience. A man, perhaps not very conspicuous, would come in on Sunday morning and introduce a man that he'd been talking with and had led to Christ, who wanted to come into the church. And they just had members adding all the time through this work of the 70. And just because the 70 had little instruction of the work, their work of the ministry, that's all. Now Mitchell is coming here. One of our graduates he speaks in the Bible work and he'll be here in February. Jack Mitchell. He has a big church in Portland. And on Sunday morning, you'll find men getting into cars and going way out somewhere to a on church district somewhere and hold a meeting and preach in a little schoolhouse. One of his members, men, officers do that. And they're down on the street corner preaching too because they've learned something about the work of the ministry. And they're just uh, hot-footed and on fire to carry that thing through. How it's going to be your business, whatever your contacts are, it's going to be your business to train members for their work of the ministry. How many of them can explain the way of salvation to a person who wants to know? How many members of the church? Well, that's for you to find out if you have a church and help them to know what to do, how to use tact and how to go on. Well, of course, you'll have to invent your own course of study and lead them into it, onto their work of the ministry. And then you are multiplying the effectiveness the average church is doing just about what one man who was hired as pastor is doing, that's all. And that sometimes isn't very much, even though he's paid a big salary. What is he hired to do? Well, he, he does circulate around a little and speaks to people sometimes. But oh, to have that multiplied by scores, you know, of those that are doing the work. I had an experience when I was assistant pastor for a year in a large church in Buffalo, and I conceived the idea of somehow getting the people in that church to work, this very idea here, though I didn't remember that I had this text before my mind especially, 
But I conceived the idea of getting the people to work. So I asked all that would like to do something definitely for Christ to stay and talk with me. And they did. And I had perhaps a dozen choice people who were ready to just plunge ahead and do whatever was, was asked them to do. <clears throat> then I sent out a card because I saw that in connection with an audience like that, there were the contacts. Every one of them had their neighbors and their friends. They all had a little a little congregation, a little clientele of their own, every one of them. Uh, someone across the hall in the apartment house or something. So I said, now please fill out in this, this card the names of people who you would think are eligible to be made interested in attending this church and upon this ministry. And I received these cards. They were nicely made out, and they were very, very helpful. Well, then I organized my workers again. I said, now I'm going to ask you to make some calls, but I'm not going to ask you to call on somebody that I haven't called on first. So I went around first and checked them up pretty well. Then I gave them a card that had four addresses on it. Four workers, number one, number two, number three, number four, and a space after each one for a report. And I gave the card to number one with a name on the outside of the party they used to call on. Or she, if it was a woman. And she was to go and make a call in behalf of the church, a spiritual call, not to talk social matters, but a spiritual call, and make out a report and hand the card to number two. And number two did the same thing, and made out a report and handed it to number three. Number three handed it to number four. Number four returned it to me. Here I had the the record of four calls with the or with the impression that they had. Now it worked in a, in a double way. It not only got those people to come, they did come. They were there. But that wasn't all. There was somebody there that recognized them and welcomed them, who had called on them and was interested and saw them when they came in and made it comfortable for them and agreeable. Well, it was a very, it became a very aggressive thing. And then I began to have people getting saved. There wouldn't be a Sunday night that there wouldn't be a good many people who would indicate their desire to be saved. And then the chief man of the church, a very wealthy man, came to me one day and he said, what's this thing you're doing here on Sunday night? Well, I said, you called me here to solve the Sunday night problem, and I'm trying to solve it. He says, how are you solving it? Well, I said, I'm getting these unsaved people into the church, into the, into the services. He said, you expect these people to join our church? Well, I said, I don't know. That's the natural thing. Well, he said, there isn't any place for those people here in this church weren't up to the society standard, that's all. Well, I said, friend, there's a huge mistake on right here, and I'm going to correct it now and save you all the embarrassment of telling me to get out. I said, I'm resigning right now. And I did and got out. Of course I got out. They didn't want it. And one of the people that was saved was a very humble woman who was a washwoman in our home. And I wondered how in the world she'd ever fit into that church she wanted to join. What could she do? Oh, when they had their banquet, she could go to the kitchen and wash the dishes for them, of course, if she'd like to do that, but she wouldn't want to do that. Now then, here's a field I'm talking about. And that's developing people in the work of the ministry that's their work. And they expect it from the from the pastor. He's pastor and teacher 
for the perfecting. That word is only used once here in this form in the New Testament. For the perfecting, completing of the saints unto their work of the ministry. Now, don't misread that. It isn't perfecting the pastor and teacher, the evangelist and the prophet and, and the apostle. It's not a perfecting them at all. But it's true then to perfect the people who are in the church. And they, I say, have a right to expect it. Oh, well, how they grow when they begin to work like that. How they grow. And how enthused they become. And they see somebody that they've led to Christ. I was preaching over in Knoxville, Tennessee, in the First Presbyterian Church on a Sunday night. And there were, I suppose, uh, six or eight young men that were deacons and serving as ushers in the church. They were back by the door there, very earnest young fellows. And I preached on the idea that that we should uh, give our gifts that in Luke that that uh, when they fail they should receive them into everlasting habitation we should receive them into everlasting habitations and I was showing that by the gift of money working through other agencies we could win souls to Christ. And after I'd finished, this bunch of young fellows came up to me, marched right up as as they came up the aisle and they took the offering. They marched up to me and one spoke for them. Do you mean to say that we could possibly win a soul by giving money? Well, I said, that's what I've been struggling to say here for 45 minutes now. I said, have you got it? We said, I, we've got it, but we never heard anything like that before. And they said, we'd give anything in the world if we could have, just have the consciousness that we were leading even one soul to Christ. Now, that was earnest and honest. And they wanted just that thing. Oh, how a pastor could have stepped in then and made up those young men just a tower of strength in that church. They'd have gone anywhere and done anything under any such conditions. They would have done it. But uh, they just didn't, they didn't have any training. The pastor didn't know a thing about it. Hadn't the slightest idea about it. In fact, I think he'd had his hard work to understand what I'd been talking about as most everybody else in the room. Because it was foreign to anything he'd ever heard. But it isn't foreign to anything you've ever heard because you've heard it this morning. (laughs) Pastor and teacher for the edifying of the saints, the perfecting of the saints unto their work of the ministry. And how long does it go on? Is it going on forever? Verse 13. Till we all come, all believers, all the elect of God, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Unto a perfect man, not perfect men. We're not now talking about perfecting men. We had that in verse 12. Perfecting the saints and the work of the ministry. But now we're talking about a body, a growing body, until we all come in the measure of the stature of the aroma of Christ, the fullness of Christ, the fullness of Christ, uh, all of his purpose fulfilled in this age and his saving grace. Till we all come into that body, then the body is perfected and it's a perfect man. It's a perfect man then. I'm not talking about perfecting saints, but a perfect man. 
not individual perfection, but the total of all put together. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wave of doctrine. Now what do you, what are you going to do? As he will, not as you will. It's not your choice, it's as he will. For as the body, the human body, is a unit, it's one. And still I have many members. And all the members of that one body being many are one body. So also is Christ. That is, Christ is in the larger definition as he shall be seen throughout all eternity will be Christ <laughs> and all his members will not be separated from him. So also is Christ the head and the body. For by one spirit, one and the self-same spirit, are we all baptized into one body, literally joined to the Lord. I've read this morning a most engaging article on this by one of our boys who graduated in the third class here. Name is Baker, Charles Baker. I just dictated to him to get other copies of the of the article that he had written. For by one spirit are we all joined to the body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free. Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. We've all been baptized by Christ giving us the spirit as I've had occasion to show to you before. And we've all been baptized by the spirit into the body of Christ. And once more I, at the risk of burdening you with monotony, I beg of you men, get your definition of the word baptized not from the ritual baptism, but get it from the spirit baptism, and make it con make it dovetail with that. If it doesn't dovetail with that, you're just in wrong. That's all. The trouble is that there has been a hasty conclusion on the part of theologians and preachers generally that every time the word baptized appear, of course, it's a it's a ritual baptism, but it isn't. It may be a spirit baptism. And the real meaning of the word is found in the spirit baptism and not in the ritual baptism at all. I'm not denying the ritual baptism. I'm not insisting upon anything connected with the ritual baptism. I've tried to keep from that. But I am insisting on the spirit baptism as being the primary essential thing. By one spirit are we all baptized into the body of Christ. Remember, with this point, we turn to Galatians 3, 27. As many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, and you did put on, and you did put off. All of those are the things that enter into this. Now, I mustn't stay here. Now, verse 14, for the body is not one member but many. Therefore, if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the ear shall say, because I am the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? It's an argument in to justify the teaching that there are a variety. There's a variety. The hand doesn't do the same thing in the body that the foot does. As a lady came up once to Dr. Schofield, she said, Oh, she said, I wish I had your gift. 
He said, Madam, did you ever see a creature that was all mouth? He said, I happen to be a mouth now. He said, we got to have something else in the body besides mouth, he said. Did you ever see a creature that was all mouth? No, there's a variety of gifts. And now then, but don't get jealous about this. And don't, don't try to, uh, uh, borrow somebody else's gift. And don't be, uh, influenced too much by it. Whatever God has for you is individual. And that's the most glorious thing that you can ever find or do, is God's will for you. Accordingly as he wills, that's the most glorious thing for you, as according as he wills, and not trying to imitate somebody else, and not wishing that you had what somebody else has, that's, that's coveting. Verse 20, but now there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee. Again, the head, Christ cannot say to the lowliest member of the foot, I have no need of thee. That's very comforting, you know, for the lowly member. And Christ cannot say, I have no need of thee. Here's this foot that trails along in the dust and dirt, always contacting the earth. And in humility, we say we're in the lowliest member of the body and then we look up and say see that hand wearing that ring I'm, I'm jealous of that I want to be a hand wearing a ring I don't want to be a lowly member dragging in the dirt I want to get up and be a hand wearing a ring no nay much more of those members of the body which we seem to be feeble are necessary and those members of the body which we think are less honorable, upon these we bestow the more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God has tempered the body together, and has given more abundant honor to that part which is lacking, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for the other. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now this is very high and wonderful truth, men. Experimentally, very high and wonderful truth. It's what should be, instead of jealousies and enmities between believers. There should be a rejoicing in each other that one has something that is a glory to God. Now I'm bringing you face to face here with one of the doctrines that stands highest in the theology of the Dallas Seminary and that is the doctrine of one body. One body with many members whether they be all busted up into sectarianism or not, I don't care. The most damnable sin is sectarianism. Now take it from me. The most damnable sin because it divides the body. And you've got 350 of them in this country alone. All of them rivals, and all of them got a bill on the church and the jangling bells and ding-dong, ding-dong, hear us. We've got it right. Nobody else has got it right. Now, hold on. We're going to wake up someday to find none of them had it right. None of them had it right. There is one body. But I can't love anybody, only those that belong to my sect. I'll run with them. I said to a preacher out in Pennsylvania, he had a wonderful grasp for the truth and a large, important church in Oklahoma wrote me and said, we'd like such and such a minister. Can you suggest one? And I thought of this man at once. 
And I, when I saw him uh, later, I said, I recommended you to such and such a church. Well, he said, what denomination is it? Oh, I said, quit that. That baby talk, leave that alone. What, what difference does it make what denomination it is now? Honestly, what difference does it make? There is a church of perhaps a thousand or more needy people, and they're reaching out their hand to you for the truth. And what you're going to do, you're going to say just because they don't say shibble it your way. You want minister to them. Now be careful. Be careful. No, he said, I couldn't go to them, and I wouldn't go to them. I'd have to stay with my own people. I said, all right. And he's right there yet, I'll tell you that. He's still right there, dying of old age, and he's never made one particle of progress. Now I'm telling you, men, a ministry, that's a pitiful thing, just as soon as a church wants a pastor. In fact, I've got him in my mail this morning from a man asking for a man to be named as pastor of their church. He says, of course, we want a man who is this, you know, this denomination. We've got to have a man that is this. We couldn't have anybody unless he's our denomination. We couldn't have him, that's all. Well, I know that they wouldn't get by with him. But be careful about that and think it through, men. Does God Almighty have to be run into that mold? And if I got to say now, Father, I'm asking thee to show me the man to recommend in that place. But of course, you've got to show me a man of this denomination. I'm put in that mold, and I'll put you in that mold. You mustn't tell me anybody that isn't in that denomination. Why not? Isn't it one body? Yes, it's one body. But then we're past that. We've got beyond that now. We're in a sectarian age in which you've got to recognize the place you're in. You've got to recognize the group, and it must be so. That denies the one body truth. That denies the one body truth. We had a boy here who was a missionary now, and he had a pastorate here in Dallas while he was studying. And one day, unwittingly, he preached a sermon on the one body. When he had finished, the officers of the church came up and said to him, we don't accept that, you know. We won't accept that here. And he was very surprised, and he tried to argue it from the scripture. They said, very well, we'll take it to the ministers of our denomination. And the ministers required him to leave that church. He couldn't preach one body in that church. No, no. No, no. If that one body, there's a body, nobody else uh, at all. Oh, that's pitiful. And I say again, it's damnable. And when Paul, I have this letter to the Corinthians, when Paul started in to correct them as he had to do, the first thing that he took up was not their immorality. As bad as immorality was, he didn't take that up first. Said, he said, there are divisions among you. And one is saying, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Another, I am of Cephas. And another, I am of Christ. There are divisions among you, and you're carnal. You're babes in Christ because of that thing. And that's what dear old Dr. Stearns used to say. Quit your baby talk as soon as you can, he says. Now stop that baby talk about being this and being that. That's only baby talk. I am of the body of Christ, and that's the biggest thing that can ever happen. You know the biggest thing that ever happened to anybody in the world has happened to everybody? Do you know that? That's to have the King of Glory come down from heaven and die for you on a cross. That's the biggest distinction that could ever come to any person in this world, that he should die for me on a cross. And now, what a tremendous distinction it is, that I have been united to him, and I am in him as a part of him. What a distinction that is, men. And why should I tear that whole thing up? and deny it with an attitude of my heart. I'm just introducing you to the doctrine of the one body and giving you all the emotion that I have in connection with it. 
And having been an evangelist working in different denominations as I had to, trying to make a union of meetings sometimes and get these elements together, I had my experiences, which suggested well for me not to try to relate. Try to get them together. You can't get them together. You can't get them together, that's all. Why? Because they've been indoctrinated falsely to think that something is bigger than something else. Now, I could go before a bunch of ministers and I can call in question the Word of God and not be attacked at all. Or I might even attack the the person of Christ and say that he was not necessarily virgin born and I won't have any reaction perhaps from that bunch of ministers but let me tag their denomination and see how I'll get it they'll tear me limb from limb if I do that the sect is more sacred today than the Savior absolutely more sacred today than the Savior and I want you to get away from that sacredness of the sect if you've got it if it's born in you from associations, just more and more and more, let's get away from it, man, and live in the one body. I told you of the woman who was in my home, a very highly instructed woman, as a guest, and at the dinner table she'd been saying a number of remarkable things as she was capable of doing, and another guest spoke up and said, Mrs. Hamlin, she said, what church do you belong to? And Mrs. Hamlin smiled and said, the only one I know anything about, <laughs> that's the body of Christ. That's the only one I belong to. The only one I know anything about. Magnify that, men. Magnify that. The one body. And remember, there isn't a scintilla, not a paragraph, not a comma that can be interpreted in the scripture as representing membership in a visible church. There isn't any such thing. That's all preacher built, every bit of it. Membership in a church, well, all right. That's the most important thing, get the members, you know. But be careful now. That's not the most important thing. To be joined to the Lord is the most important thing. Absolutely the most important thing to be joined to the Lord. And that's not a thing to be thrown one side as secondary while you take up something else that dishonors his word. No, there is no such thing in the Bible as membership. There's nothing against it, and I'm not teaching against it at all. I'm not teaching against it. I was pastor for two years down here even in the Schofield Church, where Dr. Schofield had taught for years. I was pastor there for two years at the time the seminary was founded. And one day I urged people to... I said, it doesn't make any difference whether you join this church or not. I want you to make a confession of Christ and the officers waited on me, if you please. I wonder where I got that kind of stuff that didn't make any difference whether you joined the church or not. Well, I said, I got it out of the scripture, that's all. I got it out of the scripture. It doesn't make any difference. A question of whether you belong to the Lord or not and joined to him. Magnified the things that are in the scripture, men. And now I'll let you go.